Okay, I think we're here. So uh, welcome uh, to our inaugural event tonight. The story behind the story chats with Passaic County historian Edward A. Smike. We're so happy uh, to have this brand new series that we're starting tonight. Um, and again, on, on behalf of the Patterson Museum Foundation, I'd like to thank you all for coming tonight. Uh, the Pat for those who aren't familiar with us, the Patterson Museum Foundation was formed back in 2017 to effectively be a friends group or support group for the Patterson Museum. We're a separate 501c3 uh, nonprofit um, whose goals are basically to support the museum, which includes things from artifact acquisition, program assistance, developing programs, uh, conserving uh, objects existing in the museum and a wide variety of other kinds of things. So we're so excited to have you with us tonight. And one of the things that we've started off with here now is a webinar series. So uh, we'll be on Zoom uh, for quite a while doing uh, a series of different lectures. And so everybody's aware of it. If, if you found us through Facebook, you can see the coming events that will be coming up. But we effectively have two uh, sets of webinars. One is the story behind the story that we're going to hear about tonight from, from Ed. We also have a speaker series as well, separate speaker series. We're bringing uh, historians and other folks to talk about specific things in, in Patterson history. So they'll both run parallel to each other. And so let me give you a couple dates here to mark in your calendar coming up. Uh, next week on December 21st, uh, yours truly, myself, uh, we'll be giving a lecture on the Pat a Great Patterson Fire of 1902, the story of New Jersey's biggest blaze. On January 18th, we're fortunate to have Jim Rassenberger, uh, who recently came out with a biography of Samuel Colt. And so he's going to talk about his book, um, and he's going to focus a lot on, on Samuel Colt's early history, which includes, of course, his very first factory at the corner of, of Mill and, and uh, then at the time, Boudinot Street. So, um, so we'll hear from him on January 18th. On February 15th, our own Heather Garside, who tonight is in fact the woman in the control room. Here she is right now, she's waving to you. She will have her own uh, presentation called Can't Discriminate Against Negroes, the Minerva Miller story. So that's a very interesting story from the turn of this previous century, Patterson. So we've got some exciting things coming up here. Uh, Ed and I will be coming back um, also to talk about Timothy Crane in a, in a future event as well and his relationship, of course, to the, the bridge. So please keep us in mind um, we are um, putting you in our email list, and so keep an eye out for the events that will be coming up. Um, so we're so, again, we're happy to have you tonight, and hopefully we'll have you back again. Uh, if you feel so, um, so uh, you so desire, in the chat room, I placed a link to our PayPal account. So if any one of you would like to make a donation, uh, we would appreciate that. And it goes toward, again, what we're doing tonight, um, you know, in terms of paying for the Zoom account and helps us do other things. We've got some exciting things uh, coming up uh, that we're working on. Uh, one will be announced tomorrow formally, um, dealing with the locomotives outside the museum. So again, uh, if you feel so inclined, go into the uh, Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, move your mouse to the bottom of the screen and see Q&A. The link is right there and it'll take you to our, our PayPal account. That's also the same place that if you have questions for Ed and Jack tonight, um, that that's where you could place them. And at the end of the presentation tonight, whoever has questions, we will, I'll uh, uh, forward them along with Heather. We'll forward them to Jack and Ed to see what answers they may have for you. And finally, for those of you who um, are, of course, you're all here tonight, but if you have to miss a future event, what we're doing basically is taking the Zoom recording that we're on tonight and we will upload them to the Patterson Museum's YouTube channel. So they'll li live on in and into the future. So, uh, so you can access it if you ever want to see this this program again or another one. Um, please, again, um, take a look at uh, our YouTube channel for the Patterson Museum itself. So, without further ado, uh, tonight's presentation is part one uh, about the Dye Mansion up up in Wayne that many of us are familiar with. And Ed's got a, a, a really great presentation with lots of images. So we'll hear from the two of them. So I introduce you to, many of you know them, uh, Museum Director uh, Giacomo Jack DeStefano and Ed Smike, Passaic County Historian. So 
thank you all. And again, I'm going to go on mute and we'll see you at the end of the program. Thank you very much, Glenn. I appreciate those warm words and I appreciate everything the foundation's doing for the museum and helping make our future much brighter. And actually the gentleman sitting next to me has been making my day brighter for over the last 30, 35 years that I've known him. He's a wealth of information. Anytime I have a question of Patterson or Passaic County history, or I can question what I know, I call Mr. Smike. He seems to know just about everything on the county. How, how, how did you get this knowledge though? But diligence, you... diligence, diligence, and, and, a, and a great enjoyment and learning and finding out who are the people who created these events and in, in, in our history. How many years have you been doing this? How long have you been the county historian? 40, 46 years. And how many county historians have we had? Are you the very first one? I'm the first officially appointed historian, yeah, in, uh, in, in 19, 1975. Oh my. So it's been, a, it's been a quite an adventure. I call it an adventure of discovery. And you're well on your way. Today, you're going to talk about the Dye Mansion. Yes. Uh, I've titled this um, Preservation as a Labor of Love, Saving the Dye Mansion, Washington's Headquarters. And for people, people, many people in Passaic County are familiar with the site. It's been an iconic site for years. It was constructed in 1772 by Colonel Tunis Dye, who was head of a local Burton County militia, a fellow agriculturalist with General George Washington, very well known in the state of New Jersey, uh, had been on the tap to serve on the board of Queens College, later Rutgers, Univers Rutgers University today. So what I want to talk about is how people banded together to save this site and, and get it under public control so we can enjoy it, we can enjoy it today. So we can go right into it uh, with photo number one. Heather, yes. There we go. Uh, this is a, the Dye Mansion as it substantially looks today. Although the landscaping has been changed and the gardens that were um, uh, created for the mansion back in the 1930s have been restored. There were two major restorations, one in 1933 and 34, and one in 2015 and 2016. Now, why the Dye Mansion? Well, there were over 1,275 pages of, of uh, correspondence that emanated from this building when it served as General Washington's military field headquarters in July, October, November of 1780. And it was an important site. There was the, uh, the attack on Bull's fa Ferry that was developed there. There was a failed attack on Staten Island. Uh, General Washington learned of the arrival of our French allies in, in Newport, Rhode Island. So the site played a conspicuous role in the, in the development of our, our strategies and policies. All right, we can go to number two. Photo number two. This is quite a very interesting historic photo because it shows the mansion amazingly built in 1772 and it's still intact when this photo was taken in 1902. Now the Dye family had, uh, had sold the place back in, I think it's 1801 or 1802, and a succession of other owners had purchased the property, and it was basically used as a working farm. But you can see that even the, art, the artistic finish of the masonry, the, the coining, the uh, Georgian architecture that it represents, it's basically a Georgian building with two wide center halls, with a gambrel roof, which is a direct indication of Colonel Dye's Dutch heritage. And of course, Northern New Jersey, uh, Passaic and Bergen counties, we were at the time part of Bergen County, was, were dotted with, with uh, Dutch farmsteads. But this was an unusual, this was the home of a Dutch gentleman, Colonel Dye. And uh, at the time this photo was taken, one of the earliest photos was in, um, uh, about 1902, when the building was owned by uh, William H. Belcher, who was a mayor of Patterson. We can go to number three, which is from a photo postcard. As you can see, 
the dormers on the building, the cornice is a Victorian cornice. The dormers were added much later. It was stucco placed on it. This is a tinted uh, postcard that was printed in Germany, which gives a feel of how the house looked again as a farmhouse. And how large is the estate? It was a time, a time 53, 53 acres at that time. Um, This photo was taken about 1916, and it was owned by a couple by the name of Edward A. and Elizabeth Pfister. Number four, you can go to number four. All right, this is a magazine that was put out in New York, and it's called The Spirit of 70, uh, 76. And this shows a luncheon gathering on Washington's birthday in February 1905 at France's Tavern in New York City which I had just sent to Francis Tavern, which they had never seen before, and they're going to use in their own displays. Francis Tavern, you can visit it and have lunch there. Um, what I wanted to signify here is that the ancestral societies, this happened to be a group of the Washington Continental Guard of New York, and a reenactor group. The ancestral societies, such as the Sons of the American Re Revolution, the Daughters of the American Revolution, were at the forefront and the preservation of these historic sites. So they were really early preservationists. And I have to say that they really tried very hard to bring these sites, to turn them into museums and to celebrate the early history of the country. Now, of course, uh, our interpretation of the history is, is much changed and the ancestral societies have, have come under criticism for various practices. But the fact of the matter is that without them, these sites would have not existed. They would have been gone. Uh, let's go to number five. This is a very, very decent man. His name is Robert P. Brooks, whom I knew. Robert Brooks was involved in the Captain Abraham Godwin chapter, the Sons of the American Revolution. He was also one of the incorporators of the Bisset County Historical Society in 1926. And Brooks was a, became the historian of the society he was a school principal. He studied at New York University, he received his advanced degree at Columbia. He was one of the people that was very active in, in persuading the historical society to try to see what they could do to stimulate interest in acquiring the Dye Mansion and then um, opening it as a public museum. We can go to uh, number six to show a letter that Brooks came up with. And you'll notice in the letter where he talks about where the committee suggested this old house with a reasonable amount of land would be admirably adapted for a museum and park. Now this was sent to one of the commissioners of a preliminary organization called the Preliminary Passaic County Park Commission. So here we have in 1926, this is October of 26, the society was established in March and they were keenly pushing for the preservation of this site. And again, I want to always emphasize that the people that have been involved with this were professional men and women and leading busy lives, but they had this, this great passion for trying to preserve these sites. Uh, we can go to number seven. Garrett A. Hobart, uh, was a prominent member of the uh, County Park Commission. And he, he played an even larger role when the building was acquired by the County Park Commission and restored as a public park. Uh, he was the son of the Garrett A. Hobart Sr., the 24th Vice President of the United States. And uh, he, what he did is he basically managed his father's wealth and investments he served on this commission from 1927 until 1941. And the, the record shows the considerable amount of guidance that he offered in trying to get this property saved. We'll go to letter number eight, which was sent to Robert Brooks by, the, by a man by the name of Charles Winans. Charles Winans was the uh, secretary of the Say County uh, Park Commission. And uh, as you can see, here again, this was in response to what 
Mr. Brooks had written and advising them what they should do, what the Historical Society do, should sponsor a bill to see if the state would create a commission to take over them, purchase the mansion and develop it as a public, a public museum. Let's go to number nine. Now this is the way the mansion looked in 1929. This was published in the New York Sunday Call. Uh, as you can see, there's a cow in the lower right-hand portion of the photo. This building was then owned by Michael D. and Elizabeth Alzheimer, spelled with an S, not the Z for the, for the, for the doctor who diagnosed Alzheimer's disease, but who knows, maybe a relative. It served as a working farmstead for um, Alzheimer. And uh, um, the surround, particularly the surrounding acreage, and there were a number of barns on the site, but that's how it looked at in 1929. Let's go to number 10. All right, the people that you see here, Isaac A. Servin that are mentioned, Dr. D. Stanton Hammond, William Patberg, Martin J. Hogenkamp, and Winthrop Watson were all connected in with the patriotic organizations, particularly Hammond, Servin, and Patberg. And uh, they were the individuals that pushed relentlessly to this, this campaign that they mounted to create this commission. Did they form themselves or were they appointed by? They were appointed by uh, Governor Morgan Larson. And there's a photo, I'm gonna, I'm gonna mention that. But uh, the amazing thing about them, particularly Isaac Servin, Isaac Servin was a both school principal in Garfield at the time. And also he was an attorney. D. Stanton Hammond was a school principal and he was an attorney. Winthrop, Winthrop Watson, who was mentioned, was a Passaic attorney, a Williams graduate, a Columbia graduate. And I, you know, when you look at the historical record and what these men did, Servin wrote an enormous number of articles pushing the site, discussing its history, Hammond did the same. He became the secretary of the commission. The Sons of the American Revolution, the Captain Abraham Godwin chapter, which was established in 1921, sent out 859 mailings and the members of the, the compatriots of the chapter wrote 542 newspaper articles. So the law uh, for this the Dye House Bill Number 154 became law with the signature of Governor Morgan Larson on 24 April 1929. And D. Stanton Hammond said, all of our hopes have been crowned with success. How did the owners feel who were living in the home at the time? They were... The, the owners are uh, Michael, Alzheimer, Michael Alzheimer. I think he sensed an opportunity where he was very cooperative with anybody who wanted to see the site. And I think that he was, he saw the opportunity where he could sell the property and he eventually did sell the property to the County Park Commission at a considerable profit. But he was, he was getting on in years and he felt, well, you know, why not sell the site? Now, why, why was, why did the Park Commission, we're kind of getting ahead of ourselves, why were they involved with it? Well, the, the State County Park Commission, the permanent commission, wanted to take and purchase the land surrounding the Dye Mansion for a golf course, golf course, a golf course. So we have this conjunction of two very interesting things. We have this commission that's trying to acquire it and turn it into a museum. And we have the Passaic County Park Commission that wants to construct the golf course. And without these two conjunctions, what I call of history, what would be there today? if this land didn't come under public control. The Dye, dye Mansion would no, bet, no doubt have been bulldozed and, and it would have been, you know, uh, condominiums and, and homes. So it, it was a great thing that, that this happened when it happened. 
Let's go to number uh, 11. This is what Michael D. Alzheimer's uh, farm looked like in 1929 in this photo taken by Orville B. Patterson, a uh, well-known Patterson photographer on October 29, 1929. Again, as you can see, the building remained remarkably intact. The outbuildings that you see in the right of the photo, this, they were all acquired uh, by, the, uh, by the Park Commission. They're the same vintage as the home when um the you know, some of them were some of them were earlier interestingly enough there was a new world dutch barn on the property an 18th century barn that the park commission demolished much over the objections of the dye house washington's headquarters commission because they felt that it would cost too much to restore but it was in relatively good shape it was a, a very early 18th century barn well, that was torn down in 1930. All right, let's go to number 12. These are the uh, dye house commissioners in their early inspection of the dye mansion. And this was taken in July of 1929. Uh, towards your left, you have first left is um, Martin J. Hogan camp who is a businessman. There's Dr. D. Stanton Hammond holding the rifle. And again, Hammond, Hammond was a very remarkable guy who, thank God for him, because he penned all of the official reports. And he also drafted the preliminary bill that was passed to create the Dye House Washington's Headquarters Commission. The fellow looking at the uh, spinning wheels is, is, a, is a Pat Berg, William Pat Berg. Uh, who was a printer who owned the Wayside Press in Patterson. Now, Pat Berg printed up all of the materials for the uh, Dye House Commission. The fellow pointing to an inscription that was placed on this, uh, in this room, which was what's known as Washington's office uh, by William Belcher, that is uh, Winthrop Watson. And looking on is Isaac Servan in the silk suit to the immediate right. And this artistically posed photo uh, was done by a fellow by the name of uh, uh, Drew Peters from Montclair, uh, who lived until 1964. And he took society photos for the New York Times. This appeared in the New York Times on Sunday, July 21st, 1929. We'll go to number 13. Now here are two very affable guys. We have on the right, Governor Morgan Larson, who signed the bill into law. Mar Morgan Larson was a very progressive guy that did a lot of, tried to do a lot of good things for the state of New Jersey, including Rutgers University. And he, he very, he much, very much supported the bill and he's, shaking hands with John McCutcheon. Now, John McCutcheon was a power in Passaic County politics. And what he did from behind the scenes, he lined up support on the state level by securing the aid of the county's one senator. They had only one senator at that time, Senator Roy T. Yates and the county's assembly de uh, delegation. Larson was the son of a Danish black blacksmith who came up, the, I guess, the hard way, say, and he worked his way. He was admitted to Cooper Union. And he basically had a, an engineering business. So here again, we had two people that saw the value of the property and did what they could to get this bill enacted. Uh, let's go to our uh, next uh, photo, which is number 14. Here again, we have the commissioners on their first official visit. Uh, D. Stanton Hammond to the left, Isaac Servan, Winthrop Watson, Martin Hoganham, and William Patberg on the front steps of the Dye Mansion. And this is also in 1929. We can go to number 15. This is Isaac Servan. And as I said, he's now, I say, unjustly forgotten. And this man made an immense contribution 
towards saving and then preserving the mansion. He was raised on the old servant farm in Clifton, New Jersey, he graduated local schools and studied at New York University, New York and uh, New Jersey Law School. And for a long time, he was very interested in colonial revolutionary war epics, a very meticulous researcher. And he produced a stream of articles in the local press for, on the history of the, of the Dye Mansion. And the mo one of the most significant things that he ever did, he penned an essay based on all of these original sources called Important Phases of the History of the Dye Mansion, Washington Headquarters which he modestly called the result of his individual efforts. He was one of the leading personality in the Sons of the American Revolution. And uh, he continued to publish these historical articles until his, until his, his death. And every, um, every holiday, he would manage to come out with some article on some phase of the Dye Mansion. So he's truly very, very much um, a man. There is no monument to him at the Dye Mansion or a plaque, uh, well, there should be. But they weren't doing it for themselves. They were really doing it for us. That's that's true. But, the you know, the, the, what's what's important is to try to uh, to remember and, you know, in some small way what these people did. And his role was, I say, really immense. And when you look through the records that they left behind, and there is a very good uh, documentary trail uh, that is that is now something that I had actually created a dimension archive over a period of years from 1986 and uh, I had found documents on on Servin, uh, the men and women that were involved with the dimension and it's later functioning as a museum and uh, they were all organized in 15 categories and 208 folders. And now they're up at the Dye Mansion for researchers. Let's go to number 16, Heather. This was a cover for a proposed book that I had prepared in conjunction with uh, the late Robert Brooks on the origin and early history of the Historical Society. And on the cover shows the Historical Society they would do these what they call pilgrimages to historic sites and here they are in 1930 again gathered before the um, front steps the stoop and front steps of the um, of the dye mansion all right we can go to uh, the next photo this was their big really debut event. It was the 150th anniversary of Washington's occupation of the Dye Mansion. And they had a very, very large um, event at the Dye Mansion where they uh, had a military band. Uh, they did speeches, major addresses. And as I said, Mr. McCutcheon, delivered a speech called uh, Patriotism and the Historic Dye Mansion. Now, patriotism to these, these men was not just something of like flag waving. I mean, that may have been part of it, but they just had a very intense interest in the origins of the country and in the patriot leaders. And that comes through in anything that you see that they've done. All right, we'll go to the next photo. This is, of course, President Herbert Hoover, and Hoover um, had sent a, um, uh, a message to them on July 3rd. Um, in fact, it was a telegram of, of congratulations, which we'll, we'll see. Um, and Hoover, um, the site is associated with Washington, Hoover, President Roosevelt sent a letter and also at the, at the rededication in 2016, President Obama. I'm gonna go to the next one. That is uh, President Hoover's uh, telegram where he said, greetings to those gathered, uh, but there's an important phrase where he said, Washington's occupancy, the die house, 
was a very important and the perpetuation of local tradition and national life is a valuable service in the unity of national life. National import is a valuable service in the unity of national life. Uh, D. Stanton Hammond read that telegram uh, at the event. And let's go to the next one. This was one of the signs that was printed out by uh, uh, the Wayside Press, printed by the Wayside Press, I should say, uh, Pat Berg, instructing people who wanted to drive to the mansion. And they were strategically placed, and that's probably the only one in existence. And Jackie said, well, where do you find this kind of stuff? Well, uh, there's, a, there's a really great bookstore, an ephemeris store in Morristown called The Old Bookshop, run by Chris Wolf and uh, Virginia Faulkner. And I look in the ephemeris section, and there's a bunch of material relating to this 150th anniversary of Washington's uh, arrival at the Dime Mansion. And there were a number of photographs. So they came from D. Stanton Hammond's estate. So here again, there's stuff all over that's, that pops up when you least expect it and you'll find it. And I happen to be lucky to find that, you know? Well, you gotta do more hunting in the old days. Now it's eBay for everything. Now it's eBay, now it's eBay. But even so, uh, you, you go to different bookstores, ephemera places, and if you know what you're looking for, well, that was like, You'll, I'm going to show you one of the photos that came what from that. What size was the original of this? Uh, it was about 11 by 14. And that had been, there were cracks in it. And uh, there was all, it was. Uh, uh, it printed on a cardboard? Or? It was printed on cardboard. And then I had it restored to computer, you know, computer, a computer restoration of it. But I thought it was a pretty colorful sign. We go to the next one. Okay, this is again one of those photos that I talked to you about. Now the commission hired a photographer called the Leo Studio. The man's name was Leo Solomini. And he came out with his view camera and he took a lot, a lot of photographs of the event, uh, the July 3rd, 1930 event. And this shows the tent scene. They erected a huge tent where, they, where the patriotic speeches took place. You can see it was a it was a very bright and a very hot day. People were wearing the uh, light summer clothes and, and carried umbrellas to ward off the sun. Okay, go to the next one, which was twenty two. Okay, here we have two of the principal players. The man standing to attention to the left in colonial garb was Edward J. Servin, who portrayed General Washington. Again, this was the, the reenactment of Washington's arrival, the way they thought a reenactment should be done in 1930. And there he is, and the fellow next to him is Richard Cubby, who played the, the arrival of uh, uh, General Lafayette, the Marquis de Lafayette. Now, Edward Servin, who passed away in 1976. He was Ike Servin, Isaac Servin's brother, and also a NYU graduate and school principal. And we see some of the crowd scene there. Let's go to 23. Now this is a grand soul, I call him William Henry Ralphus. Uh, 1871 to 1945. Uh, he was one of the areas at the time foremost local historians. And this is how he appeared right about the time he was active in all this activity. He was a valedictorian of the May 1920 class at the Palmer School of Chiropractic in Davenport, Iowa. But, you know, that was what he did for a living. But he, um, he studied architecture at Cooper Union. And I always said that the flame of patriotism burned brightly in Ralphus's imagination. For years, he wrote a historical column for various Patterson newspapers, primarily for the Patterson Evening News. And his major ambition, when you look through the correspondence that he left behind, was to become the curator of the Dime Mansion, which he characterized as a dear old place. 
Now, five years later in 1935, he did achieve the objective of becoming the site's first curator, but not without, uh, as I said, some anxious moments. And that I am gonna save for the second part of the uh, presentation on the restoration of the mansion. One of the things about Dr. Ralph is he loved getting dressed up as Colonel Tunis Dye. And it, visitors would, would show up there on a Sunday and there was Colonel Dye. I mean, dressed as Colonel Dye, William H. Ralph is with his tricorn hat and sword and a, and a coat that he wore. And he just loved being a reenactor. He actually lived on the property. I have to ask you, I'd have to get ahead of ourselves. Sure. But now you talk about Marquis and De Lafayette <clears throat> and uh, George Washington, of course. Of course, from Patterson, our most important player is Alexander Hamilton. He's part of Washington's military family. That's right. And he was at, of course, he was at the, the at the, at the, the, the Dye Mansion. <laughs> he penned, he penned a series of letters about his, uh, stay there and he said that uh, there was a uh, one of the die one of the die uh, daughters was this buxom buxom gal that he that of course he noticed right away so it, it wasn't just i think all military uh, i mean he he could appreciate uh, a lovely woman <laughs> but he yes he was at the dimension he penned some of the correspondence he was very valuable to washington because uh, uh, uh hamilton was pretty fluent in french and that was very useful when uh, Washington had to meet with any of the French officers or even the Marquis de Lafayette. Let's go to 24. Here is another photograph taken by the Leo studio showing uh, Dr. Ralph's garb, again, as Colonel Dye, uh, while, with, while shaking hands with uh, the Marquis de Lafayette and some colonial ladies from the local DAR chapters welcoming, welcoming them, welcome them, welcome them to the Dye Mansion. Yeah, they were the the uh, the reenactors were recruited from the ranks of the Sons of the American Revolution, Daughter of American Revolutions organizations. Let's go to twenty six. This is, these are the principal members again, assembled as you can see to your, to your left, uh, Richard C S. Covey, uh, Edward Servin, uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Ralphus, and uh, some of the colonial ladies who participated in this event in 1930. Let me go to the next one. Here again, is Dr. Hammond. He had read, he had read his address and I said he confidently uh, uh, spoke about the importance of the Declaration of Independence, and he read a lot of uh, telegrams and letters that had been received. Now, one of the things about Hammond was uh, he was the man who got me involved in local history. I'll give you a little aside. There was an article on me. I found a collection of glass plate negatives on the history of the SUM. And it was in the Patterson uh, Central High School newspaper called the Tatler. And I'm summoned to the office of the principal, Dr. Herbert Lipsitz. And I said, what did I do wrong, you know? So you're a student at the school. I'm a time. student, that's right. I was, a, I was a student at the school, this is back in 1962. And there's this elderly gentleman with a briefcase. And he had read about this article in the school newspaper. And he said to me, you know, you. You, you really should join the historical society. You're interested in local history. Well, that was Dr. Hammond. He was a born educator. He was principal of school 20 in Patterson. And he had told me that he went out, he went to, to a New York University. He got his undergraduate degree there in pedagogy education in 1912. And he goes back and, I, and he, he earns a doctor of jurisprudence. And he said, well, I really... I really thought of getting into the legal business because he loved to do uh, researching in titles, title research. And that man made many, many very wonderful maps that we still use today that plot, they show the plots of streets and the owners of property. And he did them not only for here, he did them for other areas and he was, he was the map man. 
So there he is uh, in, in 1930. And we'll go to the next photo. And there he is, uh, an, a snapshot taken by someone else, surveying the scene confidently uh, after the end. And directly in back of him, you see um, uh, John McCutcheon. I will go to the next one. Now there I am back in, oh God, was it 1978? After high school. Yeah, that was long after high school. I'd been <laughs> county historian for only a few years. And there's Dr. Hammond. And here again, he was um, still extremely active and told me, he said, all oh, this kept him, kept him young. He gives an interview, uh, which I promoted to the newspaper. He's 91 years old. And they asked him about his role in the Dye House Washington's headquarters commission. And he told them, he said, I had been secretary of the commission. And he said, well, the place had really changed from the days they had these chickens and, and uh, farm animals running around. So he was like your mentor? He was one of them, yeah, one of them. It says this was taken at the Harvest Day, which is an event that had been organized by the then curator Raymond F. Dye every October. And they would have, uh, with the emphasis was on, uh, you know, it, it was an attempt, an attempt, and it succeeded to have reenactors and bring people to the Dye Mansion, get them interested in history. Let's go to the next one. This shows the Dye Mansion uh, in a Patterson News photo taken in February of 1934. Now, what happened was that the Dye House Washington's Headquarters Commission of the state of New Jersey did not achieve a, its objective of getting the $75,000 appropriation that they wanted to purchase the building and restore it as a museum. But the Passaic County Park Commission stepped in. And this was, a, this was during the Great Depression when nobody had any money. So uh, the Park Commission manages to purchase the property for $78,000, which included several barns and 55 acres of, of, of land. And with the active um, advice of the man I mentioned before, Garrity Hobart Jr., they restored the building under the uh, supervision of Charles Over Cornelius, who was a former curator of dec decorative arts. He was a national authority on colonial design and a, uh, a recognized, one of, the, one of the best restoration architects at that time in the country. Cornelius uh, attended Princeton and then MIT, and he was responsible for drawing the plans and specifications. And here you see them beginning the work in 1934. So on that one, they removed the stucco that was put on an exposed- That's correct, I'm glad you said that. They had removed the stucco, and, uh, which had been on both sides of the mansion. But here again, what's so amazing about that? The mansion is still, it is such a well-built structure, which was again confirmed in the restoration that was done in 2015, 2016. And it helped that it was always occupied or used. It was never left abandoned at any no, point. No, it was never, no, it was never, it was never abandoned. So, I mean, it has been a public museum now since 1934 and it's kind of, it is the centerpiece of the, of the county's historic sites under county jurisdictions. Let's go to the next photo. Okay, we showed President Hoover and this wonderful photo, which Jack found, shows Franklin Delano Roosevelt. And the, one of the reasons I showed Roosevelt is because the Park Commission, St. County Park Commission, was able to tap into the federal relief programs, such as the Civil Works Administration program, the WPA programs. And they had to put some money into the restoration, but they had the labor was contributed, the skilled workmen were contributed by the federal government. So we have to thank uh, FDR for the programs that he had started that enabled this to happen because it put to work a lot of people that had been out of work and it really allevi alleviated a lot of the, the misery that we had. And I wanna go to the, to the next letter. This I'm gonna discuss further in the second part of the program, but this is the letter that FDR wrote um, to the Gar Garrett Hobart Jr. Uh, which was read aloud at the 
dedication of the, the, the restored dimension in 1934. And he said, I said, you, you know, I congratulate you and the other members of the Passaic County Park Commission upon the foresight which made possible a preservation of this building. You've made a real contribution to the history of the nation. So this is going to be my jumping of off point for part two of our, uh, uh, the actual restoration of the Dye Mansion, which will take place on January 13th. Who reached out to the presidents for these notes? Was Hobart still had his connections because of his that's father? An, that's, that's another interesting story. Yeah, that was generated through Hobart and the Park Administration, Charles Winans. And they contacted, they invited President Mrs. Roosevelt, but of course they couldn't attend. But they contacted his, uh, uh, one of his, his, Steve Early, who coordinated this and actually got this letter. And this is, a, this is one that Roosevelt himself signed. So, you know. Uh, Where's this letter today? Well, this letter has been framed. This, this was another very interesting story. I knew the letter existed. When I saved all this Dye Mansion correspondent, it was nowhere to be found. And one day I was at the Dye Mansion and they had in storage a number of framed documents. And there it was. And, and, and curator Ray Guy, he was retired, he's still alive. And he said to me, well, you know, I found that in a file, this letter. And he said, I thought it should be on display at the mansion. And he had it on in display. And what I, what I had done is it wasn't archivally framed and it had gotten a little faded. So I had it archivally framed. It is now on display uh, at the Dye Mansion with the letter that President Obama wrote, with, but both with engravings of the two presidents. So that's, that's where it is. Um, so, you know, I, I think it's, this is just, again, a, a, a brief review of the material that is available. And it is my fervent hope that what, what we have saved will still stimulate other people to do the research. And, you know, when you looked at how the dimension was furnished and the, the material that was, that was on display, a lot of it was donated, some really good, really good things were donated to the dimension, great furnishings. That's going to be in part two. I'm going to, I'm going to touch on it. I'm going to show some of what the rooms looked like at that time. And they were aiming for a very formal, uh, a very formal appearance of the dimension. And there, was, there were two schools of thought. It, well, did Colonel Dye really have these elaborate gardens? Did he have all these, these furnishings? We couldn't really find out through the in, inventory wills and other what Colonel Dye had. So at that time, they were interested more in, in the formality of the place. But you know, history is something that is constantly being reinterpreted. So the way the Sons of the American Revolution, the DAR, wanted to furnish the place, they were going to furnish some of the rooms. Today, we have a different view, and we have the technologies available, as you know, Jack, what you're trying to do with the Patterson Museum, to use the, the great technologies that we have available to, uh, to bring this history to the fore. And people say to me, when you looked at some of these photographs, you see that they're very sharp. What I did is I had them uh, all uh, uh, scanned and enhanced. You, you can get a photograph that's pretty much lost today with scanning, you can bring back the image. How, how many years have you worked on just researching the dimension alone? 40, 43, 44 years on and off. And one of the, one of my big contributions, I was very much involved with the restoration of it. And uh, one of the things that I wanted to get done is a man, a very wonderful man by the name of Willard Luther Dio. And I'm just going to hold up this publication that we did, uh, which is distributed at the Dime Mansion's dedication. And but Willard Dio was an attorney, you know, a, a graduate of Princeton and, and Columbia Law School. He retired from the legal profession and he spent the rest of his life, 20 years, doing one thing, documenting the history of the American Revolution in northern New Jersey in this area. And he actually owned a set of the writings of General Washington, which were published by the George Washington Bicentennial Commission. See, George Washington fever 
right about this time, another conjunction of history, the nation was going to celebrate the 200th anniversary of Washington's birth. So they created earlier a commission in the late 20s to do that. And they planned for this. And one of the lasting contributions of that commission, they tried to turn up everything possible on George Washington. And they did. It's now been supplanted by a, a more modern edition, but uh, they put out a 39 volume edition of the writings of Washington, which was a lasting contribution. So there was, you know, in, in the 1930s and he, the 1933, 1934, while well, the country was going through this cataclysmic upheaval, uh, they were they were celebrating Washington's birthday with rather pageants. They distributed the uh, George Washington uh, Commission distributed the lithographs of the Gilbert Stewart, one of the best images of Washington, to every schoolhouse in the country. So patriotism was running high. And you know, a friend of mine from that time told me he said when he went to school, he said Washington was suspended in his powdered wig glory in our classroom. <laughs> you know, so uh, people had a lot of time on their hands because. Well, it was jobs were virtually non-existent for many people, and the libraries were very crowded. And the, you know, there was a, a tremendous interest at that time in local history. Now, the original committee that you know started this to preserve it. How would they feel today if they could see that what's been done up to this point? I think they would be very, very proud to know that these men who labored and women too, and the members, ladies of the DAR and they made their own contribution, they would be so proud to know that they managed to save this building and that other people who came after, after them carried it on because we are all actors on a scene and we're all going to pass from the scene, but we can leave a lasting legacy. And that's what these members of the Die House Washington Headquarters Commission did. So, uh, I, so yeah, um, so thank you both for a wonderful presentation. We've uh, already got one question coming on. Before, uh, before you ask that question, yes. I just wanted to tell everybody that if you're interested in studying or learning more about George Washington and how he was associated with all these historic sites, you have to read this book by Carol Ann Marley. Marlin, and it was published in 1988 called George Washington Slept Here. And it is Colonial Revivals in American Culture, 1876 to 1986. It was published by Harvard University Press, but it's not an excessively academic book. I mean, it's very well written, very well in, illustrated. And, and you, you know, you can really learn a lot about Washington's primacy and how it developed. Yes, sir. Excellent. 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 Thank you. Thank you for that recommendation, Ed. Um, we'll get to, I have a question for Dennis. I'll get to that in a moment, but I think sort of the, tonight's part one about the dimension is really the thrust of how important was um, of, of having a group of, of, uh, of folks who come together as a grassroots effort to uh, secure this building for, for future, uh, future, visitations and restoration and what have you. I, and we see this from time to time, right, Ed? Uh, you and I have talked about other people like this. Um, like Janet you know, course, Norwood. Yeah, Janet Norwood, who I knew uh, many years ago um, in the what, what now is the Ridgewood Historical Society, was a critical uh, person in getting the hermitage uh, acquired by the state of New Jersey and eventually getting it restored to what it is now a state park as well. Uh, we think, of course, about Mary Ellen Kramer as well, who did all the work to save the historic district in Patterson from the from the um, bad intentions of the state uh, highway department, basically. We have so, a home here, thanks to Mary Ellen. Exactly, exactly. So well, the, these folks who came together to preserve the dimension, I mean, they are the, they are, they, it didn't come from government. It came from individual groups of individuals who saw the importance of this and then basically had it. Uh, put forth to government so that they should be playing a big role in things. So, so, and, that, uh, and, yeah. and you know, you, you knew Mrs. Norwood. I had many number of conversations with her, and she, uh, there's a, there's a great passion that they have. 
but Claire Thull in Bergen County. Right. Claire Thull is another one, right. Trained as an architect. A Adrian Leiby, who wrote, who is an, again, an attorney, who his passion was documenting the revolution in, in Bergen County. So, you know, they leave behind a great legacy, like the right. Stone Houses uh, uh, survey that Claire did for Bergen County. Yeah, and, and, and we hope that perhaps even for the dimension that the individuals you've mentioned here will be recognized one way or another. Um, like Claire, Claire actually has the Bergen County uh, Preservation Ward named after her. So um, so that would be very appropriate for that. Um, let, let me get to the first question here from Dennis. Dennis was wondering if uh, D. Stan Hammond, Dr. Hammond's work with maps, would he have, did he have any relationship to the Hammond map company? No, the, no there was no... Uh... There was no connection. I asked Dr. Hammond that himself. Okay, but, <laughs> well, there you go. Dennis, it, there's your answer. So I, on a personal note, I have to tell you that my father was a student of, of School 20 and knew D. Stan Hammond, I'm sure, very well. And the fact that I'm on this session tonight probably is related to him as well, because my dad was so interested in history. And of course, I picked it up as well. So we thank Dr. Hammond for, for many things here. Uh, we have a question from Terrence. Uh, can you tell us how much the interior was in its original shape, moldings, doors, and so forth? Uh, I'm, I'm assuming he means like when um, servant and, and when folks was, took over the building. Yeah, that is a Terrence has asked a very good question because there were photos taken of the house for a New York Times article in 1890 something or other, and uh, they wrote an article in the house. They sent a photographer up. And the place was fur was furnished in the Victorian style, you know, Axe Minister type carpets, the, the kind of decorations that were elaborate decorations. But the mold, the moldings, the wainscoting, the fireplaces, they were intact. And what what the floors were intact, and what wasn't intact, like there were there were uh, some of the, the shutters. They found an original shutter, so they duplicated that. They did that with the doors too. There was one or two doors that were intact from 1772, but the moldings that you'll see in the place, the woodwork is intact. And what what the what was done when they did the the paint analysis? So in those days, they did a paint analysis. They just scraped some paint down, and then they would come up with a color. Now, of course, you know it's done by microscopes and everything else, so you can get the actual colors that were used at that time. So the answer is question yes most of the moldings were remained, they were intact. That's an excellent Woodwork, question. Wainscoting, yeah. Because that's not always the case in a lot of buildings, right? That uh, No. A no, lot of people, for example, outside. right, outside. like Appomattox Courthouse, the famous signing there, it's all a rebuild. It's not even, a, most of it's not original. So this is, this is at the other end of the spectrum. There's a lot of originality to the dimension. Well, here, here was a, in a very, in Washington's office, there was a, a, a large hole in the floor. When I say large, it had to be maybe five inches in circumference that a rodent had eaten through it. So what, what the restoration architect specified, we had to use wood from 1772 or thereabouts. And the, uh, the firm that, the Dell Tech Historic Restoration that did it, they found wood from that period and not only that they matched the grain and they did what the, it was like a dutchman repair i mean you'd never know it was done right so well, you know you you can you can find this this stuff if you if you look for it to remarkable do a really accurate record restoration that's remarkable and the the dye family uh, i mean we we're talking um about one uh branch of the dye family but the dyes were all over new york city Yes. Um, New York State, New Jersey, um, you know, Anthony Dye, who was also born um, in, in North Jersey and actually in Wayne, today's Wayne, um, you know, he was a, a very big player. He's the guy that actually, along with a couple other people, purchased Paul's Hook, which is a, a big City. chunk of Jersey City mm -hmm. today. So so we know him for that. And one interesting thing that uh, no, a lot of people don't know about him. He was the large, Anthony Dye was the largest consumer of night soil out of New York City, where he brought to his plant on the Hackensack River called the Lodi <laughs> Manufacturing Company. 
And for those of you who don't know what night soil is, Google it. You'll find out. <laughs> Google it's, it was night a soil is. substance yeah. Yeah. that they used to make fertilizer. So the dyes were, and there's dye street in New York, of course. I mean, there's, there's dyes all over the place, but this is the one that, of course, is most famous for us is uh, doing it. So, so I'm looking. I don't see any more questions. Uh, Jack, do you have any uh, final comments for Ed? Or yeah, actually, I'm just looking forward to part two. Okay. You know, that was excellent, Ed. I, re I really want to thank you for thank, that. Thank you. I, I, not to be funny, I was hanging on every word. It was really excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. You know, it. it if, if these, what, what we're doing at this museum, and what I'm trying to do, you're trying to do, if we can reach out uh, across all boundaries because there is history here for everybody to enjoy. And if we can get people interested in history and preservation, I think we make it a better country. I really do. I agree with you. I, I think that's, it's important that we instill pride. And, and of course the word you described patriotism to us before, but just even just simply historical rec you know, recognition of historic sites and, and his, our own history here, it's so important. Is, I, um, the, is the dye yeah. mansion open right now? No, it's closed for, because so, of the pandemic. They still closed it. But, you know, today when we talk about patriotism, it's used, I mean, look, there were people in the, in the 18th century that were excessively patriotic too. But patriotism, patriotism is not to be used as a cudgel to bludgeon people. Patriotism is to instill pride of place. It's all about pride. Your nation right. and your family. Right. That's what it's all about. Right, exactly. So I, I just, before we close tonight, I just want to mention part two uh, will be on January 13th. Um, we'll have uh, Ed and Jack back again to do part two of the dimension. And on January 27th, Ed and I will be together talking about Timothy Crane and his his involvement in Patterson and the falls, the bridge, the pleasure garden, all those kind of things. Uh, importantly, uh, each one of these events we're running um, will all be eventually uh, posted to YouTube. So if you ever want to see these again, you can go to our YouTube channel at the Patterson Museum. It's now uh, in the chat box um, and you can see all the videos. There's several up there already. We've done a right air and article. Um, Jack did a, a presentation on the museum a couple weeks ago. So there's a lot of, there'll be a lot of cool stuff that we're going to build upon. And so we're so happy that we're able to do this because um, that's what the Patterson Museum Foundation is all about, is, is, is helping the museum. And we think this is a wonderful way to reach to really anyone around the world, actually, who would want to participate with what we're doing. So uh, I don't see any more questions, so I think we can bring it to a close. Heather, I'll bring Heather, our control room expert, back on for a moment. She'll put okay. her camera on. She's also, by the way, I didn't mention, she's also the curator of the Patterson Museum. So Heather, Heather, there I'm she on. is. You'll be seeing her again on her pre presentation in February on Minerva Miller. She's done a wonderful amount of research on that. It's a story that virtually no one knows about. And uh, so we'll be so excited to hear about that. So um, I'd like to thank uh, you, Glenn and, and Jack and Heather thank you, uh, for, for making this successful, you know, and yep. getting out this message. And next week, don't forget you're on. You're promoting everyone. Let's we're have Great Fire 1902. Looking forward. That's right. That's right. You can even smell the smoke through the through the computer, can't you? I can hear the okay. I can hear the I can hear the shriek of the fireworks. I can hear the shriek right now. We had a great exhibit when we celebrated the hundredth anniversary, which you were essentially the curator of that exhibit. So well, thank you. Yeah. So we're it's uh, a wonderful time. No, we will. We will. It's always a it's always a fun time telling that story with all the not, not just the more tragic of certainly the tragic issues, but all the. Uh, really unusual and, and to some extent um, unbelievable things that happened during that fire. So, so anyway, without uh, any, uh, I don't think we have any more discussion points here. I'm looking, you don't see any. So uh, looking forward to, uh, again to seeing you all next week. Um, and again, follow us on Facebook. Uh, you'll see all our dates are on there. Um, so you can keep track of what we're doing. And all of you signed up for tonight will be getting emails from us on future events and things like that. So again, thank you so much. Thank and you, uh, everybody. Thank we'll you. see you soon. Thank you. Thank Thank you. Good night. Good night now.